Hello, good evening. Populist parties are growing in strength across Europe, emboldened by both Brexit and Trump. There's Marine Le Pen and the National Front in France, of course, but there's a critical election before that next month in Holland. Gert Wilders, who leads the anti-Muslim Freedom Party, is hoping to top the ballot. He wants to take them out of the EU and to de-Islamise the Netherlands with a ban on immigration from Muslim countries. In 2016, he was convicted of inciting discrimination. The Dutch coalition system means it's pretty unlikely Wilders will be crowned prime minister, but he could end up leading the largest party, which would chill European centrists and boost other populist movements throughout the continent. We sent our bear in a duffel coat, John Sweeney, in hot pursuit. Nederland, a schitterend land. A land van onze voorouders. Het land This is the election campaign video of the far-right Dutch Freedom Party. Ons enige vaderland. Unsurprisingly, they believe in freedom, independence and the future. Van onze onafhankelijkheid. On Brexit, they say, the British did it. And the Americans did it too. Mark Rutte. Here's the party's leader and sole member, Geert Wilders. The map, borrowed perhaps from Dad's army, suggests that by the end of the century there will be four billion Africans and many will make a beeline for the Netherlands. Wilders links refugees, especially Muslim ones, with terror attacks. Go and vote, he concludes, and make the Netherlands ours again. Thank you. Wilders is a hard man to track down, but if you go down to the Dutch Parliament, you might be in for a big surprise. We're on Wilders' watch. Uh, the great man's going to come down those stairs through here, into the chamber, and that's our one chance to have a natter with him. Mr. Builders, you from BBC Newsnight. Are you going to do to Holland what Mr. Trump is doing to America? Well, I know. Um, um, I am no Mr. Trump. I am my own man and my own party in my own country. But indeed, there is what I call a patriotic spring going on. We saw the beginning of it with Brexit that um, even though the political elite was, um, 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 well, making sure that the people were afraid to vote uh, in favor of leaving the uh, European Union, the people did, in the majority. We saw um, in um, the United States that um, despite all the rhetoric of the elite, Mr. Trump won the election. I hope um, I can repeat the same thing because once again, the people want to be in charge again. It's not only uh, America first, it's also Holland first, and that's what I try to accomplish. Some people say that you're a bit of a fascist, though. Some people say that. Well, don't listen to those uh, people, some of them, but it's totally untrue. Wilder's hostility to Islam has led to death threats, so he's guarded by the police around the clock. But his message strikes a chord here. Around one in five Dutch voters are expected to plump for the Freedom Party on March 15th. In The Hague, I hit the pedals to find out why. The Valentine's Day tat was out, but love was in short supply. Gerd Builders, you're going to vote for him? Yes. The, the blonde one? Yes. Why are you going to vote for him? Because I'm fed up with all those mumbo yumbo talking in the government and it uh, doesn't work anything. They say, look what we have done, what we have done. There's a lot of people who have not enough money to get around. When I was young, Holland was the most open and tolerant society. Yes. Something's changed. Why is that? Because we have a small country. And then there's an explosion of people, too many children, too many people who, yeah, they have to help him, but it's full. We are full. You understand? He's looking where the people are uh, angry about and he's saying exactly what they want to hear. Because he's saying things like, our older people have to uh, get uh, good medical care. He's saying something, but he's not going to do it. Because the only thing he's doing is talk bad about the Muslims and give them the blame for everything. But most people don't trust the other politics, so 
they want they want to trust him to see what he's gonna do. Then a strange thing happens. Wilders must have liked my robust approach as I get a phone call inviting me for a formal interview. Kurt Wilders, when did you last go for a walk on your own? On my own? Well, yeah. that's something like, wow, 12, 13 years ago. All on my own, drive, drive a car, uh, go do some shopping or um, um, empty my own mailbox at home. Being at ho my own home is, um, um, is more than 12 years ago, unfortunately. I'm on the death list from, well, um, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, um, many of that kind of organizations. What's the biggest cause um, by terror of the loss of Dutch lives in the last few years? Well, um, we were lucky um, to not have the kind of attacks that, for instance, Germany, Belgium, France, even the United Kingdom, with the London attacks had. I was thinking about MH17. Sorry, there? I was thinking about MH17. MH17, yes. 193 Dutch people die. Yes. They're entirely innocent in a civilian airliner. That's true. Shot down. Sure. And the prime Terrible. suspect is Putin's Russia. Well, we have, to, um, we have to see about that. I'm sure it has to be cleared, and I'm not... I would not bet that Russia had nothing to do with that, but still, let's wait for the prosecutor um, um, who is working on it now to handle But You could be right. Um, I'm not ignoring right. that. The, the, Russians, but say, listen, we the are... Russians say it's the Ukrainians. Either way, 193 people die. They're Dutch. And it has got nothing whatsoever to do with Muslims. Very true. And we so have to see and wait. No, because, I don't well. know. because there are other dangers in the world, yes. aren't there? There's North Korea, there's Putin's Russia, sure. and there are Islamist extremists, Islamic, Islamist fascists. Unfortunately, so they aren't don't. you a bit obsessed with just one element of the spectrum here, which is the Muslim spectrum, while ignoring perhaps Russian fascism? I tell you, the more that we um, import Islam, and I'm, I'm not talking about all the people, I'm not saying once again that all the people are. Um, um, extremist people, but the ideology and freedom are incompatible. So we are facing an existential problem here. If we allow to open our borders, if we allow to ignore the problems uh, that we are facing today, let alone later in the century with the demographic situation in Africa, we will cease to exist. Our values, our identity will not be taken away by the European Union only, but by um, the Islamization of our society. And that does not work. And I want it to be stopped. Point. So Trump um, has pushed uh, America first. Yes. You have Netherlands first, America first, Germany first, yes. Russia first. Don't we go back to 1939? No. I don't think so. I think that is a fear that some politicians put into our heads. But um, they forget telling us that we um, um, made a kind of other totalitarian organization dominant, which is called the European Union. I just had... And the European Union is totalitarian? It's totally totalitarian. I'm you not speak saying... your mind in China and in Russia, you yes. may end up dead. I'm not, not saying... in Brussels, I'm not, not saying... in Strasbourg. I'm not saying it's totalitarian to all the citizens of the European Union, but it's totalitarian towards the member states. You believe in the politics of identity? Don't you? Who doesn't? Well, I suppose the people who believe in liberal democracy, the idea that everybody is equal under the law. It's a different people way of looking equal. at the world. People are equal. Ideologies, values are not equal. Religions are not equal. And what I told you before, the cultural relativists, people who believe that all cultures are equal, are the, 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 the proof of the biggest disease Europe faced in the last decades. Cultural relativists who say um, Islamic culture is the same as Christianity, allow them and don't demand from them to integrate and to assimilate. This is the worst thing that has happened to us. Many Dutch find his views not just repellent but dangerous. So will Gerd Wilders take power on March 15th? Probably not, as the mainstream parties will do their best to block him. But there's no doubting this man is changing what was once 
the most liberal country in Europe, into something quite different. John Sweeney there. So is the talk of populist revolution in Europe overblown or are we mad to ignore the warning signals? Well, at the moment, Gert Wilders is leading the opinion polls in the Netherlands with around 19% of the vote. That's three points ahead of his nearest rival. And in France, Le Pen also expected to be ahead in the first round of the presidential election a month later on, the on 26%. So do these parties really have a chance of winning power? And critically, what's their presence doing to the policies of the moderates? Joining us now, The Times columnist David Aronovich, Sarah Hobbelt, Professor of European Politics at LSE, and Yasha Mount, Harvard political theorist. It's very nice to have you all here. Thanks for coming in. And Sarah, I just want you to put this in context for us. We've sort of played around with some of the numbers there of the polls, but how close to power do you believe Wilders is right now? I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by power. He is close to being the largest party in the Netherlands, but that doesn't mean he will win a majority. But it does mean that he will be, a, you know, a power to be reckoned with when it comes to coalition formation. Because he, he can't be a prime minister, as it were, on his own. No, so he will not, no party in the Netherlands will win a majority. There will have to be some kind of coalition. And if he's the largest party, it might be that he will be the first person to be asked to form that coalition. So far, the other parties have said, we're not going to want to go into government with you. Uh, that doesn't rule out, of course, that there could be another centre-right minority government where he is the main supporting party. We've seen that before in between 2010 and 12 in the Netherlands, uh, where, where his party, Wilders Party, was indeed providing the parliamentary support and gaining s concessions like that. And David, you say that nothing to worry about. <laughs> certainly don't say there's nothing to worry about. My, my concern is a, is a slightly different one, and it is that we have managed to paint what has happened, uh, happening in Europe uh, a bit Britain and to a certain extent America as well, as a kind of revolt of a majority. We kind of talk about it as if what you have is something akin to a revolutionary situation with the masses coming down the street like in... Uh, because we call it populism. In, in Les Miserables. Partly because we call it populism and so on. But actually, when you look at, firstly, the demographics and the continuing demographics of the people who are supporting these, these parties, they tend to be declining demographics. They are older uh, and so on. They, belong, they tend to have jobs in industries that are declining and, uh, and so on. That, that's the first point about them. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't worry about it. You should worry about it for the reasons I suspect that my colleagues here are going to say you should worry about it, which is the influence that they can have on other parties. And um, there is, I suppose, and I can't rule out the possibility that somebody like Marine Le Pen will win, but actually they're pretty much blocked out at about 25%. And in some places we get very, very uptight about, like in Germany, with the Alternative für Deutschland. You're talking about a party that never really gets above 12% in the polls. Now that will give them representation, but it won't give them any more representation than the Linker party, the left party, had much in the last election, and we never even noticed it. Yes, is that right, that they might be influencing other mainstream parties, but they in themselves are not actually a threat? Do you find that? They're certainly influencing other mainstream parties, and we're already seeing that effect reflected in European politics. Uh, but no, I worry about them being able to win majorities. Um, everybody said that Brexit wouldn't happen, and it did. Everybody said that Donald Trump could never get elected, and he did. Um, in countries like Sweden or Germany, five or ten years ago, you had no far-right populist parties strong in the system. Now they are the second biggest party, the third biggest party in polls. I don't think there's an inbuilt limit to this. And when you look at a bunch of broader opinion polls, you see that they do unfortunately represent the majority of the population on many questions. So for example, most Europeans in every country where that was polled a couple of days ago now believe that we should have no further immigration from Muslim majority is countries it, is whatsoever. It crazy to miss these signals. No, I, I mean, I, again, I completely understand what Yesh is saying, but there's a bit of a danger of saying we got the, I'm feeling like this, we got it badly wrong over Brexit, we were bruised over Brexit, you know, pollsters particularly, bruised over Trump, therefore in order not to get bruised again, we'll talk up all these other parties and so on. And one of the problems that I have is, we've had an interview, a really good interview with Hirt Wilders. Yesterday morning on the Today programme, we heard an interview with Marine Le Pen. 
I bet the significant proportion of the British population can't name any other politician, either in France, apart from Francois Hollande, and certainly not in Holland, where it's quite likely actually that, that the, Prime the, well, the Prime Minister's party might very well actually lead Wilders in the polls. He, this party of Wilders's was at this level in the polls back in 2013. Sarah, do you think that the polls do relate to the kind of coverage that these politicians are getting? I mean, I think there are good reasons uh, for why they're getting coverage because there has been a sort of step change uh, and first of all I, I, I don't think that Brexit wasn't predicted by anyone that's clearly not true it was a close race all along everyone knew it was close uh, so it's not to you know not to say that no one thought this was sort of in the balance um, uh, but in terms of uh, they're getting a lot of coverage I mean what we are seeing uh, after the financial crisis is they've always been populist parties on the right but there's really been a step change in how popular they are and we're not talking about pluralities but no party win a sort of outright majority and they have been influential not only outside government in terms of setting the agenda and the agenda has shifted in European politics much more towards anti-immigration uh, Euroscepticism, but also inside government. Yes, yeah, so we started this evening asking, you know, are, are liberal democracies in Europe actually in, in permanent decline? There was a time when that question seemed unthinkable and it doesn't seem very long ago. Do you think they are now? So in political science for a long time people believed that once you're relatively wealthy you've had a couple of changes of government for free and fair elections democracy is consolidated, it's safe, it's become the only game in town and so in some of my recent research I look at this question what does it mean for democracy to be the only game in town? Well at least it has to mean that most citizens give great importance to living in a democracy, that they reject or for return alternatives to democracy, and that they don't vote for people who really criticize democracy in a deep way. Now, the World Value Survey shows that that is not true in most countries in North America and Western Europe now. That the number of people who say, you know what, democracy take it or leave it is not important to me to live in a democracy, has gone up very rapidly. That the number of people who and say... these are the young, according to your science, these yes. are the young people saying that. How does that tie in, David, with the idea that the people who are, you know, are in decline, that the people who are voting for these radical... Um, well, I mean, I suppose the question is also from what to what. I mean, the, uh, one of the key sets of social attitudes, say, in this country was is measurable by would you mind if your child married somebody of another race and so on. For years and years and years and years, you'd see a majority in this country would say no to that. Gradually, you've seen a majority in the country say they're not bothered by it. And it has not been because old people, by and large, changed their minds. It's because younger people came in with that attitude, gradually developed that attitude, and never lost and it. And does it go straight back to the question that John asked Gert Wilders, which is, nationalism has become so much in the body now because for years people lived with the idea of the sovereign the nation state and then we start talking in these sort of bodies if you like but groups that, and but that but that again I think is to a certain extent a generational question not in all countries but in a lot of countries it is a generational question and by and large again younger people do tend to see themselves as more interdependent that's hardly surprising look at but how you they think behave that's gone now. I mean, yeah that's I, what I, 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 I think that younger people are much more polarized so there's a lot more young people who are very used to multi-ethnic democracies, they're used to interacting with people from all kinds of origins and backgrounds and so on, but there's also many young people who very, very fervently reject that. So when you look at France's support for, the, uh, um, for, for Le Pen's party, uh, the Front National, when you look in Germany, support for the Alternative for Deutschland, um, actually among young people, they are especially strong. Um, and I think this is a matter of a long-term transition, that many European democracies were founded as mono-ethnic, monocultural countries, they have over time, often without really thinking about it, become multi-ethnic because of immigration and so on. And a, a big portion of the population has accepted that, has made the peace with that, has embraced that, mm. celebrates that. But there's also a big portion of the population that says, no, what it means to be Dutch is that you are descended from Dutch people and everything else doesn't count. So the big question of the next 20, 30 years is whether we can get people to broaden their sense of identity. And there's no historical precedent that shows it can be done. It's a new experiment. Does it feel to you, Sarah, like this is still a protest voice or this is something now able to transform the landscape of Europe over the coming year? It's clear that, that the party system in Europe is under some kind of transformation and that's been going on for a long time because we've seen this loosening of ties between you know, established 
left-wing parties, right-wing parties that had their supporters. And now we have a much more uh, volatile electoral landscapes where people pick and choose. And therefore, it's also therefore that parties like Wilders Party have the power to sort of shape a discourse, a narrative, and, and appeal to a broader range of people exactly because they don't have these close ties anymore to you know, a labor movement or a Christian democratic movement. Thank you all very much. Thanks for coming.